Saratoga County is full of forgotten crossroads, each developed in support of the needs of early settlers to provide for their families. Each evolved based on the uniqueness of these families, their backgrounds, their hopes and dreams. For Bacon Hill, it was the land that drew families together, extensive farmland surrounding a small crossroads in the countryside. Six generations after the pioneer settlers arrived, many of the founding families are still here, continuing to build their family's legacy. Welcome to Bacon Hill. My name is Bill Peck. I am the town supervisor here in the town of Northumberland, located in Saratoga County. Bacon Hill is a community that was settled over 200 years ago, based on farming, family, and faith. As many of the families that settled here in the early 1800s are still farming this community today. The church sits at the center of the community as farm fields stretch out in every direction. To begin the story of this farming community three miles northwest of Schuylerville, New York, it might be best to start with its name. Arriving in 1794, Lathrop Pope and Ebenezer Bacon were soon able to put their own stamp on the crossroads first referred to as Fiddler's Corners or Fiddletown. As it turns out, it was not a coincidence that these two families arrived in Bacon Hill at the same time. Their ancestors had lived in Plymouth and Barnstable, Massachusetts, before moving to Lebanon, Connecticut around 1750. There, Martha Bacon married Seth Pope, and Lathrop was born in 1753. Martha's younger brother, Ebenezer, was born six years later, making Lathrop Ebenezer's nephew. Ebenezer served as a soldier in the American Revolution, enlisting in the 3rd Connecticut Regiment, where he rose to the rank of sergeant. By 1790, Ebenezer Bacon had married and moved to Stillwater, New York, where his first children were born. Joined briefly there by his nephew, in 1794 they both relocated 10 miles north to a small crossroads then known as Fiddler's Corners. There Ebenezer purchased 63 acres for 120 pounds and opened a tavern and a store. Lathrop established a blacksmith shop frequented by the growing number of farmers settling near the crossroads, which soon became known as Pope's Corners. Ebenezer died in 1817 at the age of 57, and Lathrop moved on to Essex County, New York, in 1832. The crossroads officially became known as Bacon Hill, but was often referred to as Pope's Corners for another 30 years. In 1970, Ebenezer's abandoned house still stood just west of the Grange Hall, soon to find new life. The arrival of Pope and Bacon was preceded by other families who began settling in Bacon Hill in the 1780s, shortly after the end of the Revolution. This is um, Martin Vandewerker, my fourth great-grandfather, uh, and uh, the start of the five generations of my line that lived in the town in Northumberland. He and his brother Isaac were both uh, Revolutionary War soldiers, uh, serving as privates and Martin also as a corporal in the militia between 1775 and 1783. At the end of the revolution, about two years afterward, uh, both Isaac and brother Martin uh, left Washington County and moved to the town of Northumberland, uh, both in the proximity of Bacon Hill. This is the Bacon Hill Cemetery marker of my great-grandparents, Jones Archie Vandewerker Jr and his wife, uh, Lucretia Abigail Brown. Jones and Lucretia had 14 children, but seven died before reaching their fifth birthday, four of which lived less than a year. Six small stones memorialized their deaths. Twin boys Robert and Leroy died within eight days of each other in 1894, and their names are inscribed on a single stone. Of the seven surviving boys, uh, is Archie, who uh, married Maud Galusha and had three children of his own. One set was a twin, uh, twin boys, and he committed suicide in 1908. My grandfather, uh, 
Earl Edward Vanderwerker Sr. Uh, was the fifth generation of the Vanderwerkers that lived in the town of Northumberland. While Martin Vanderwerker moved a few miles north to Brownville, his brother Isaac and Isaac's son Sovereign established large farms in Bacon Hill. Children of Sovereign and his wife Lucy Ross left a lasting impact on Bacon Hill that is still visible today. Daughters Melinda and Mary married into the Peck and Kerrigan families. The brick home of James Kerrigan and the stately home of Sovereign's son Isaac still stand today along Route 32. He walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known. In 1818 September the Northumberland Meeting House Society actually met and decided that they were going to build a house of worship in, in or near Bacon Hill. It took until 1820 for them to actually build the church and they decided at that time to become a Protestant Dutch Reformed Church. Okay, some early names that we found um, in, the, in the early minutes of the church were Olmsteed, Bullard, Coffinger, Williams, Pope, Palmer, Harris, Vanderwerker, Bean, Cook, Winnie. So I think it's always interesting to note that back when the church was founded, women were not ever put into positions of leadership. They could cook the meals for the consistory when the consistory met at their house, but they were not allowed to make make the decisions but they could raise the money and they did most of the fundraising so they did things like lord's acre auctions they made quilts aprons crocheted things they sold whatever they could find and they just made all these kinds of things and they really were the ones that built the church financially july of 1950 they made the decision to move the church back it was in 2014, we did a whole lot of renovation outside. We did, the steeple was in very bad shape, so it was taken down and completely rebuilt. A very sad, tragic accident. The bridge in Skahari on the throughway fell, and two of our members went down with that bridge, Mary Lou Peck and her daughter Kristen. As a result of that, the family, um, as a memorial, gave a stained glass window which really represented their family. Um, there were sheep, there were cows, it was the rolling hills. It's a beautiful window that just really commemorates their lives. We share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. The Peck ancestors come from England, from uh, Hingham, England, and they came in 1638 and settled in Hingham, Massachusetts, just below Boston. Okay, Amos Peck uh, married uh, Mary Wagman, came to uh, Saratoga County in about 1810. Henry Wagman Peck then married Melinda Vanderwerker from up in Bacon Hill and bought property in Bacon Hill in 1836. <laughs> Family lore says that George Henry Peck was told by his father to buy the neighbor's farm. He bought the farm and also reported that he would marry the neighbor's daughter, Sarah Caroline Kramer. That farm was inherited by his second son and is today Clear Echo Farm. George Henry Peck and Sarah Caroline Kramer Peck had three children. Their first son, Henry Kramer Peck, my grandfather, inherited the homestead farm. He was a pillar of the community, becoming supervisor, a leader in the Grange, church, and agriculture organizations. My grandparents, Henry Kramer Peck and Sarah Mary 
McNeil had five children, including my father. Uh, one was Uncle Willard Peck, who inherited the Welcome Stock Farm, and like his father, was a pillar in the community, graduating from Albany Business College, taking courses in Cornell, and then excelling in agriculture. He was a master of the Bacon Hill Grange, a leader in his church. Son Bill and grandsons Billy and Neil now operate Welcome Stock Farm. By the end of the Civil War, Bacon Hill had become a thriving crossroads. Wagons laboring up the hill from Schuylerville along today's Route 32 would first view the fake family house, the store of Reed Peck, and to the left, the homestead of Captain Martin Burke, who lost his life in the Mexican War. Just across the road, the Bacon Hill Hotel welcomed travelers on their journey. The post office, located in the tailor shop of Isaac Bemis, Blacksmith shops and a wagon shop came into view as he reached the fork in the road, overlooked by the stately home of A.H. Pearsall. Continuing right on the main road, the imposing Dutch Reformed Church, the center of the community then, as now, kept watch over the homes scattered among the businesses of the hamlet. Just beyond, schoolhouse number eight welcomed the community's children. Across the road, the melodious voice of carpenter and church elder Malachi Moody could be heard throughout the village. Northward, along Stonebridge Road, the cemetery was already the eternal resting place of many members of Bacon Hill's founding families. My name's Donald Lee Griffin, Sr. I live here with my wife, Dale Griffin. Growing up, I was born in Peekskill, New York in 1940. My parents moved far, farther north up to Greenfield Center. We bought a home on a dead-end road. After I graduated from Cornell University in June 14, 1965, I uh, did my student teaching at Schuylerville Central School. How I got into antique houses and stuff, I grew up in an 1800 Comstock house in Greenfield, and my parents had antiques, and I've always been into that. He told me about a possible house in Bacon Hill. So we went, my wife and I went there and met Fred and Elsie Gard, and uh, we looked at the house, and uh, it had been moved in 1904 by Oxen, by the Larman House Movers, which are still in business, back on the farm, and they built a big Victorian house where it was located on the corner. Uh, when we found the house and looked at it, my wife and I, it was in pretty rough shape. Uh, it had been moved back on the farm, and they just sat it on rocks, and of course, that allowed the woodchucks and, the, and the, all of the underneath beams for the floor were rotted. Pretty okay. My wife and I were there with Fred and Elsie Gard, and I said, I think we're, we're going to do something with it and fix it up. And uh, we sort of convinced them. I mean, <laughs> went home, and wouldn't you know, that night, Fred Dopp dropped dead. Uh, waited about 10 days or more, and then we went back and saw Elsie, and uh, we asked her, uh, what, what is the situation with the house now? And she said, we have decided to sell you the house for one dollar. Well, we got the house and we, I started to dissemble it. But then I started up on the roof, removing the slate and the shingles and the roofers. And you can see all the uh, rafters. It's a Dutch pattern house with ten bents, number one through ten, from south to north. Everything was numbered, braces, corners, trusses, everything. I was all the time uh, hauling uh, anything I took out over to my property here in town of Jackson and putting it in the barn. Brian Clothier from Corinth, who I graduated with, uh, he's the one that had his pickup truck. I didn't have a pickup truck. I only had a trailer. And he's the one that brought the long pieces over.
The Dio family moved to Bacon Hill in 1840. The family patriarch, Daniel Dio Sr., was a Revolutionary War veteran who lived in Pittstown, Rensselaer County. His son, Daniel Jr., moved to Saratoga Springs in 1833 before purchasing a 100-acre farm from Benjamin Lossy in Bacon Hill. Daniel died in 1855. He had eight children, including five sons, that became prominent members of the Bacon Hill community in the late 19th century. William was the postmaster, and both he and Augustus served as town supervisors and died on the same day in 1914. Daniel Dio III also served as supervisor and was a state assemblyman and a Saratoga County Sheriff. He owned the farm located on the corner of Goff Road and Wall Street. John Dio is a descendant of Augustus. Would be my great-great-uncle, William Dio, was a farmer and a lumberman. But he and his brother were in a dispute, Augustus, were in a dispute over mail handling in, in Bacon Hill, and William didn't want rural delivery, and Augustus evidently did, and it caused a rift in the family that was... Uh, didn't end until after, well, it didn't end until they both had passed. Oh, we lived there for a very brief period of time when we came back from Massachusetts um, in 1950. And it was, uh, my grandmother had a, her, an apartment and my uncle Gus had an apartment there. And uh, my uncle Gus ran the farm, but my grandmother continued to own the farm. Kids there with my cousins, it was a fun place to be. After my uncle Gus passed, my father and his sister had inherited the farm and they sold it to cousin Bill. And then uh, Bill, my cousin, had the opportunity to sell it to the two people, two brothers from Connecticut. And they bought it and then it was no longer in the family. I know that Daniel that lived there was a sheriff and the telephone story about me having the first phone in, in Bacon Hill. Again, the farm was very, it was it was larger in my mind than a hundred acres then, because it was it was very sizable when when uh, when William, my grandfather, had it. My father would tell stories about going to plow with a fortune tractor and have, having the tractor get so hot you couldn't sit on it. And then I know he related the story. He'd rather plow with horses than he would to plow with that tractor. Evelyn, my grandmother, was a sparling. And Ray Sparling had a Studebaker dealer right across from the church, and just across 32 up in, in, in the church, and that became um, Larry Zinter, Zinter Handler, owned that later on. I did a lot of work for Zinter Handler. And we built the, the house 23 years ago, the garage the year after that. And then I built the barn, um, you know, soon after that. And it's all worked out. I'm, I'm happy with my life, if you can't tell. During summers when he would, um, my grandfather Earl was up at uh, Willsboro Point Summer House, he would come and visit Bacon Hill. Um, he revisited the Bacon Hill Cemetery with his uh, parents and his siblings are buried. Um, he revisited the Bacon Hill Reformed Church. Between the church and the school was the gladiola field of Myrtle Brown Winnie and her husband Irvin. So the, uh, the old schoolhouse where he attended and where he would, um, one of his jobs as a, as a nine-year-old, apparently, according to my grandmother, was to light the fire in the school to uh, make sure it was warm for the students. My first direct experience not having grown up at Bacon Hill was when my father and my brothers and I visited our Aunt Grace, who was uh, Grace Vandewerker Vandewerker. We went to the old Bates house uh, where they lived. Uh, Grace was a gracious host and uh, gave us, serves us lemonade and cookies. things we want to talk about is our one-room schoolhouse which was next to the church and we walked a mile every day to go to school and it was uh, eighth grades and our teacher was Hazel Sparling.
So we not only learned our own uh, lessons, but we were able to listen in on other grades. And sometimes in the winter, winter time, uh, it was a pot belly stove that, that uh, heated the school, and we would uh, toast cheese sandwiches on the uh, stove for our lunch. Well, we had to walk in the rain and the snow and all that to school, but I think we were healthier for it. We had our own meat and chickens, and I can remember having to pick the feathers off of chickens. And uh, during the war, uh, there were some food items that were very difficult to obtain. Uh, so we made our own butter. We had a barn with uh, Guernsey cows, and we had 18 in one barn and uh, that we milked with a milk machine. And we had another barn on the end of it. We had eight stalls where we had eight cows, and we milked them by hand. It was great growing up on a farm because we not only had cows, we had work horses. We had another horse that we'd ride sometimes, so we had to learn how to saddle the horse and take the horse out for a ride. We did that often. And uh, Sometimes I'd ride the horse down to Bacon Hill, and the horse didn't really want to go to Bacon Hill. So each driveway we came to, we had to turn around about three times. But coming home, it didn't take long. <laughs> <laughs> also, uh, the orchard, we, in the orchard there were a lot of uh, milkweeds and uh, they couldn't, uh, they needed KPOC for uh, the war, for lifesavers, and if people were in the ocean needed uh, life preservers. And uh, so we used to, that was a 4-H project, we went to the uh, orchard, picked uh, milkweed pods and, buy, and put them in big onion bags, like uh, mesh bags. And uh, that was kind of a neat thing that I remember from that time. And we sold a team of horses every occasionally. <clears throat> so that was just our extra income. We also had sheep. So we had to shear the sheep and take care of the sheep and milking cows. We had Guernsey cows at the time. Got a premium for our milk because it was Guernsey, registered Guernsey milk, uh, Guernsey gold, they call it. And then in the spring, before planting time, we'd get the sawmill going. And, and I was kind of down on that because We'd always be sawing to get those lumber, get some money out for the lumber, so you sell the lumber when we should have been starting planting. So it made us a little bit late starting planting, and I <laughs> didn't like that too well. So I got kind of down on the sawmill. Uh, one thing that was nice that we had, uh, uh, my father bought a horse, and we called her Queenie. And uh, that was the horse we rode. Well, then uh, we decided that maybe it would be nice to have a colt. So she had a colt that was half Arabian, that was my brother's pride and joy. When I was four years old, I milked my first cow. And she was an easy milker and she didn't kick. And so my dad let me sit down there and there was nine cows in that row. And whoever was milking, milked the other eight while I was milking that one cow. But I was four years old. And, and what did you milk. sit on? What did you sit on? A milking stool? Yeah. With how many legs? One leg. Yeah, one leg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Some of my friends, well, in my one was in my grade, were the pet girls. And they lived on the corner, uh, in right in the middle of Bacon Hill. So across the road, on the other corner, was uh, there was a man there that lived by himself. His name was John <coughs> Fake. And we just went over there and he didn't care what we did. The highlight of visiting him was riding down the banister. At my house, we had a, a, a banister too, but every time we got on the banister, somebody would catch us and say, you're not supposed to be riding down the banister. <laughs> it was so much fun when we went to the Grange dinners. They always had dinners. And, oh, that was a big treat to go to have dinner at the Grange. And also the church. The church did dinners quite often. And uh, so that was that was our going out to meet, eat. We never went out to eat hardly ever, except mm -hmm. for the Grange and the church, right? <laughs> oh, the square dancing was so much fun. Every every week, was that every week, right? Yeah. Saturday night. Yeah, Saturday, Saturday night. night. Yeah. Was a place to go from Bacon Hill. They were fun. We looked forward to them. But Durgy Town uh, had, uh, had uh, barn dances. This uh, this place in Durgy Town, uh, they uh, built a new barn 
and they thought that before they used the barn that they would help to pay for it by having um, maybe a few barn dances. So they had barn dances there and that was a you go upstairs into the into the hayloft part, but it was all hardwood floor, and uh, it was a big place, and it was packed. And we'd go up there, uh, and people came from all over Fort Edward and Hudson Falls and Argyle and Bacon Hill. <laughs> it did and, so well that they yeah. ended up just having dances and not putting the cows in there. Dick Richards, he uh, he used to uh, call the dances and. And uh, and he played uh, bass, and he also played uh, a violin. It was it was good, clean fun, you know. They sold refreshments, soda, no alcoholic beverages. Uh, then sometimes after the dance, why we'd go to a restaurant in Fort Edward. Aunt uh, Meldred Peck, auntie, she was auntie to everybody. Uh, she had an egg egg root in Glens Falls, and she would uh, kill some chickens, take orders uh, the week before for who would like to have a chicken, and uh, how many dozen eggs they wanted, and if there were uh, vegetables in the garden to pick, she had those. Uh, one, my first thing going with her, I was going to go with her one one week, and I had planted some radishes, so I. I cleaned the radishes and bunched them up and sold them on the egg root with her. But it was really a treat to go uh, with her, and she just knew the streets in Glens Falls very well. As auntie was quite a character. She knew most everything about everybody, and uh, she was kind enough um, when my wife and I got married in 1989 to arrange a wedding reception in the in the basement of the Bacon Hill Reformed Church so I could meet relatives I never met. So my Aunt Mildred, who we called Auntie, was uh, very influential in her community. She uh, was a tax collector. She made baked, all kinds of baked goods all the time. You always got a treat when you went to her house. When she got in her late 90s, she started giving these gifts back to people that she had acquired. And so I've given her three little porcelain chickens, and I have them back now, and they're on top of my uh, dresser uh, display cabinet. And um, that's just one example of things that she tended to do. I've been on a road, I can't recall, it's right next to Bill Peck's farm. It's just a short road, and there was this early two story colonial with some barns around it abandoned. But I, I talked about getting that house with Bill Peck and uh, Mildred told me, she says, you don't want that house. You don't want that. It's cursed. I said, what do you mean it's cursed? She said, when I was a little girl, the family that lived there, during one winter, their daughter, we assume died. She just was never seen again. And uh, people were suspicious of these people. They were kind of like, what did they do to the girl? You know, I mean, there's no evidence that she died of a disease or anything. So Mildred said, the house is cursed. You don't want that. Which is the way those people, Mildred and Elsie, that's the way they talked. Um, Auntie was one who would help everyone. And if somebody was in need, she would, she would get on the phone and... Uh, commandeer everybody in the community to help. Because I know at one time Winnie's had a fire and uh, she thought to herself, oh, well, I can't do much here, but I can call people to, to go and help the Winnie's and um, make food and see what they needed from, from the fire. She was always helping the, neighbor, the neighbors in the community.
My name is Brian Carmer. I'm president of Stonebridge Iron and Steel. We're located here in Gansvort, New York. Um, a little bit of the family history of Stonebridge. Originally, my father, Ron Carmer, worked at American Bridge Company, and that was located in Elmira, New York. And Ron had, uh, had actually worked for a fabricator in Glens Falls that went out of business. And at that time, he uh, bought some of their equipment and little by little had enough equipment built up where we actually, he actually decided to start a fabrication shop. This farm down here, which was an old chicken farm, turned into a horse farm, became available for sale, and they were able to, uh, to actually purchase the, the property here. So basically cut a hole in the side of the, the barn and started fabricating steel. There, one of the farmers up the, up the road had an old crane sitting out in his field. And so I stopped and saw him and said, hey, can I, can I borrow your crane? And he said, if you can get it started, you can use it. So I tinkered with it and got it started. We drove it over here and I actually used that to put the first part of the shop up. Um, he decided to... Uh, you know, make it a, make a go for it. And, you know, my mother was supporting him. And you know, we came to an agreement on what we were gonna try to achieve here. My brother, Britt, who is uh, my partner here now, he, he's four years younger than I. So he, he came in a little bit later, but uh, he, uh, you know, he started right at the bottom, just like I did. Government regulations are a real challenge. They continue to change every year. You can't hardly keep up with them. Um, we also have a lot of competition from Canadian fabricators. Technology is also a real challenge, um, trying to keep up with the latest tools and equipment, machinery. It's a, it's a big investment, which helps our workforce. It makes it easier for them to, to do the work, and it also keeps our quality high. At the current uh, time, we're actually at about 90 employees. We spend a lot of time training people. So when we get, we get somebody that shows up that doesn't know a lot about steel, um, we, don't in, we don't mind investing in them. We've got a lot of employees that have been with us for over 30 years at this point. As the business grew, the, it was obvious that uh, having the, the office inside my parents' house just wasn't gonna, wasn't gonna work for us. So we quickly, uh, I guess the easiest solution was to remodel part of the chicken coop that wasn't torn down and create a, an office out there. That was our first office. It was definitely a slow but steady growth pattern over the years. William Leggett purchased 25 acres in 1873 and it got passed down through the generations. Brian Thomas is the sixth generation from that. But as far as the egg industry part of it, we're relatively new. So in 1948, Jared and Eleanor Thomas purchased 500 chickens and they processed the eggs in the cellar of their home. And he would take the extra eggs and sell them from this pickup truck to his coworkers at Sandy Hill. We're very proud of our size. We're a small family farm and we can control the quality. We take pride in the fact that we have several family members very involved in our business. So Brian has four nephews that are very actively involved in the farm and also his daughter is working on our farm. One of the nephews has a son who is technically now the fourth generation since we started doing eggs to be working on the farm. When Brian and Ken first started working here, so much was manual. We gathered the eggs, we packed the eggs by hand. To go from gathering by hand to what you saw in the video is just never ceases to amaze me. When the hen lays an egg in the barn, it's often untouched by a human hand all the way until you get it in the store. It's automatically rolls down the cage onto a belt, comes out to the, the washing part of the machine, it's dried, it's checked for cracks, it's checked for dirt, blood spots, make sure the interior quality is fine. It's packed according to its weight. And some of our unique challenges being an egg producer for one thing is the environment of the chickens. They have to be have it just right. We have alarms that go off if there isn't enough 
water if the if it's too cold if it's too hot so for example three o'clock then a sunday afternoon you're having a family party and the alarms go off because it's too hot they've got to go adjust the ventilation system another challenge faced by poultry farmers is diseases currently while this video is being filmed we're, we're in the middle of another avian influenza epidemic it was terrible in the spring millions of birds had to be put down because they contracted the disease and a few flocks have gotten it again this fall as the migration goes the other direction. So this is why the cost of the eggs in the stores is very high right now. You know, it's affected supply, so there's less chickens to lay the eggs. So the law of supply and demand dominate the egg market. We also take pride in the fact that we distribute our own product. Brian and his partner Ken and the four nephews all do delivery routes. We have about 20 routes a week and we, we go to local Hannaford's and the mom and pop shops and all the restaurants and local businesses in the area. Stewart's comes to our farm every day to pick up their eggs, so every egg you buy in a Stewart store comes from our farm. Like many of the farms in the area, agriculture is running in our bloodstream. We have three daughters, Brian and I do, and their names are Amy, Melanie, and Chelsea. The youngest daughter, Chelsea, is here on the farm with us. As far as the future of our farm, we have a lot of hope. We are currently celebrating our 75th year of egg production, and we have the third and fourth generation very interested in keeping that tradition going. across from the church up to my house it was nothing but gladiolas. Uh, we, we started the gladiolas in 1920. My grandmother, like, uh, and so all she was doing is uh, raising gladiolas, not for profit, but for fun. And then Richard Dean from Saratoga said, I can, I'll buy all the flowers you can get. And that's how we ended up uh, growing up to 65 acres of gladiolus. My father, we had a brand new field of bulbs, 12 acre field, and uh, he had me plowing down. And then that was the end of the gladiolus. The last gladiola was in 1970, but I'm still planning on planting about a couple, maybe 3,000 bulbs just to have just to have fun. I give them away. My grandfather always said if you want to have a small farm, what you want to do is do something that nobody else is doing. And so he planted uh, seven acres of blueberries. They worked out real good. And now I'm up to 40 acres. It is a lot of blueberries. It's the biggest uh, blueberry farm in New York State. There's a tremendous amount of people out there who want blueberries and want them in their freezers, as many as they can, and, and as reasonable as they can. And uh, I, can pick the blue, I can pick the blueberries, or they can pick their own. I mean, I've been trying to buy this machine for three years. Might as well see if I can get it for a reasonable price. And so pick the berries, and then we'll go into 15 pound boxes, there's 10 quarts per box, or we'll sell 10 pound boxes. Well, I plan on operating a lot differently. What my plan is an awful lot of juice. I'm going to buy juice equipment, and that's not as terribly expensive as uh, you would think. And I'll probably sell half liters, maybe liters. Welcome Stock Farm is owned and operated by myself, my brother Neil Peck, and my father William Peck. We are the sixth generation here on Welcome Stock Farm. We're a dairy operation. We uh, milk a thousand mature cows and have another 1,100 of young stock, young uh, heifers and calves. I am Neil Peck, the sixth generation here at Welcome Stock Farm. My farthest recollection of the dairy is when our fourth generation grandfather was milking 26 cows in our stanchion barn 
1969, my father decided he wanted to take over the dairy and expand the herd. So in 1969, he built the first modern freestall barn here at Welcome Stock Farm. So this has been quite a transition from our father, our grandfather, and even two more generations before. But our father graduating from Cobleskill College in 1956 and returning to the farm, to the farm with his father. The changes in agriculture have been ex uh, extensive over the generations. When I was a kid, you know, this farm milked 85 cows. Today, 40 years later, we milk 1,000 cows. And that's part of the economics of farming. In the late 60s and early 70s, uh, many farms, like our farm here, converted from Guernsey's to Holstein, started in 1969, as milk was uh, packaged in plastic and not glass anymore. Uh, the golden cream rising to the top wasn't as valuable. So the Holstein cow was more efficient, produced more milk, uh, was able to convert feed more efficiently. And so many farms across uh, New York and this country started that conversion from the Guernsey breed to the Holstein. With farming, you need to continue to grow your business and diversify. One of the ways we've diversified, my father started, was through genetics. For every calf on this farm is a tissue sample is sent off to a lab and what we call ge uh, genomic tested. That way we can rank those animals at uh, three weeks of age uh, where they rank amongst their mates. In 2013, we all decided that it was time for a new milking facility to advance us into most modern day technology of, of milking cows. The same facility that we are milking 1,000 cows today. And the latest thing we do here in this facility is we direct load our milk onto the transport trailers. So as, as kids, we were very active in 4-H. You had your local club, uh, which gets you to know, you know all your neighboring farm kids, but also at the county level. Uh, so we got to meet the farm kids that were from throughout the county and participate in 4-H and Cooperative Extension had other uh, activities. But the most interesting thing here at Welcome Stock Farm is our two wives. Uh, Neil's wife, Kristen Talbot, was a three-time Olympic long track speed skater. And she introduced uh, uh, me to my wife, Amy Peterson, from St. Paul, Minnesota, was a five-time Olympic short track speed skater who also carried the flag in the opening ceremonies to the 2002 Salt Lake City Games. The question often arises, what leads you back to the farm? Well, for myself and my brother, it's really a family affair that's gone on for generations and our love of the land. As a father of four young boys, my hopes are that one of them will want to come back or two of them or more, come back and continue uh, the dairy operation here at Welcome Stock Farm. When you look around Bacon Hill and you see the farm families that are here, we all have a common goal. It's, it's to see our families succeed in the farming community and also to give back to the community, whether that be the church, the school systems, and our neighbors. We try to be good stewards of the land. operation here at King's Ransom Farm uh, consists of actually a couple of businesses. We have our we have our farming business and we milk about a thousand cows uh, and also raise about 1,200 head of young stock replacements. Uh, and in order to feed those cows, we we crop we farm about 3,000 acres of corn and grass, alfalfa, and soybeans. The other aspect of our business would be King Brothers Dairy, and we uh, originated that business here back in 2010 and brought back the tradition of our milk bottling and processing and delivery that we, uh, my family had done back in the 1900s. And over the years, uh, we've become very well known and internationally recognized, each of us in our own way. You know, a lot of folks maybe would not realize but it really has brought Bacon Hill a different type of notoriety really around the world in the cattle breeding business. As farmers, we, 
we really, on a daily basis, we deal with a lot of challenges. The trend has been toward fewer yet larger farms. And the reason that farms are getting larger is uh, it's, it's really a matter of simple economics and efficiencies. As, as a result, our farms tend to grow over time. The bigger challenge is how do we grow to that next step? One of the reasons that we moved into uh, the retail business was to uh, try to get a little bit of different business growth uh, without having to milk more cows. When we, when we talk about the next generation uh, joining the farm and, and uh, some of the family history that we've had, I really value being able to grow up on a farm. And I looked at myself versus other kids that grew up in town, and I, I really was convinced that I had the best childhood ever. Part of that was due to my father, Edgar King, who was town supervisor back in the 1990s. He led the farm's first movement Again, citing the county dump in the town. The thing that resonates with me is I come across people all the time who talk about what a great job he did and how much they respected him. He was a person who said what he believed, and you could always count on him working for the people in the town. He really set the standards that I hope to pass on to my own children. Hi, my name is Jonathan King. I'm 22 years old. I just graduated from Cornell University uh, majoring in animal science and just in the summer I returned back home to work here with my family. So my hope to one day is to keep growing our family business. Um, I have two siblings and two cousins and for one day to be able to work with all of, of my family members I think that just would be a really special thing to be working alongside them um, as we keep uh, progressing as we move forward. My name is Kevin Peck and I am I'm the current owner of Clear Echo Farm. Um, and as the story was told to me by my father, uh, that back in 1867, uh, George Henry Peck um, walked across the field from Welcome Stock Farm and to this piece of property and with a sack of gold or a, a gold piece or whatever and he purchased the original 97 acres that the farmstead sits on today. And back then, uh, they milked a few cows, they had sheep, they harvested timber. So that makes me a fifth generation uh, on this farm. Right from when I was a kid, and I think my mother could probably attest to it better, uh, I always had an interest in the farm. And, and we milked approximately 100 cows Everybody did chores together, then everybody did crops together, then everybody came back and did chores together. So I ended up, I went to Cornell from um, 1988 to 1991, or graduated in 91, and came directly home to the farm. Uh, and then within a year afterwards, in 1992, we did our first big expansion. Uh, at the current state, we own a thousand acres, about 700 of that is tillable. We're able to make all the forage that we need for the, for the cows. So in 2002, we expanded to 500 cows. Um, and I do have two sons, Matthew Peck, uh, who graduated from Cornell last year and is currently working at a farm in Western New York. And then my younger son, Ryan Peck, is a freshman at Cobleskill. Both of them plan to come home and take over the, far the farm. Um, and, and we're in a lot of discussion as to where that goes. If we're looking 20 to 30 years from now, and what my son's challenges will be is how can we be that? Uh, we need to be one of two things. We either need to be more efficient or and low cost, or we need to have a niche. In the past, we have, we've had a niche in the genetic lineup. Uh, that niche is starting to fade away. Um, so we have sat down, my wife, my mother, and my two sons, and talked about where does Clear Echo go. Hi, my name is Jean Peck, and i here with my son, Kevin, able to be working in the fields if they needed me. I could drive the tractor. I could feed the calves. Um, at one point, we had calves and hutches, and I was doing taking care of the calves, too. 
Uh, what I yeah. do now is I am the bookkeeper for the farm. Well, Mary Lou and I were very, very close. We were the outlaws that were married to, to <laughs> Peck, so yeah. we got together a lot. So she was also pregnant, and she delivered Billy at 6.15. I took, went in the hospital, and I had him at 9.30. So they've grown up together. They've gone to school together. They played football and basketball together. Neil and I from Welcome Stock worked together well also when it comes to cropping. Uh, as we, we continue to expand a little bit, of course, we have to travel farther for land. And I think both Neil and I are, you know, up to 13 miles away. Well, to draw haylage back 13 miles takes a, takes a fleet of trucks. So we've worked very well together in, in kind of coordinating, hey, I'm going to be way over in Greenwich on Tuesday. Can you help me drive? And then, okay, they you know, will say, hey, I'll, then I'll do my Easton or Stillwater property on Thursday and we'll, and then we'll drive truck for him and trying to set up for my, my boys to have success. I don't want to just kind of run the farm for the next five, six, seven years until I'm like, yeah, I can retire. And okay, here you go, Matthew Ryan. Good, l good luck. You know, I don't want to do that to him. <laughs> I come to the garden alone. So I'm a um, pastor of this church, Reverend Janet Meyer Vincent, and um, I'm actually a fourth generation minister um, and been serving all in the Reformed Church. My grandfather, my great grandfather, my father, and now me. I am the first uh, woman pastor of that, that generation. So the Reformed Church is um, a, a mainline Protestant denomination um, with Dutch roots. We sing hymns and prayers, um, follow a liturgy that begins with an approach to God. Um, then we hear God's word, a reading of the scripture, a sermon. And then as a response to God's word, we sing again um, and have prayers for the people. So mission is a huge part of, of, our, of our life here. Um, and it's not just giving money. Every second Sunday of the month, we have a focused mission that is our mission for the whole month. And we rotate that particular mission to whatever is in, in news. I, for example, um, the war in Ukraine, um, the hurricane in Florida. Every December, we adopt a family of Schuylerville School. And this year, we're, we're doing a family of five kids um, where we get Christmas gifts for them. Um, we do have an active Sunday school. We have a potential of probably 30 children, um, our vacation Bible school in the summer. Um, we've had as many as almost 60, 60. 60 children who come from all over, all different churches, and come together for a week of Bible work and learning Bible verses and having crafts and music and, and just lots of fun. Um, one of the other um, blessings that we have here is a ministry to our youth. We cooked and served a meal uh, to the homeless down in Saratoga. The highlight of every youth group here is a weekend retreat up at our camp um, that Denomination owns in Speculator, Camp Fowler. For the last 10 years, we've had a 5K and then added a 10K race called the Bacon Hill Bonanza, and every year it it raises money for the church, but it also, 10% of the proceeds go to a mission, um, a local mission in the community. When I was interviewed, they had, um, we have a search committee, and on the search committee were three high school students that were part of the group. And the three students took me aside, away from the grown-ups, and they wanted to know what I was going to do for the older generation not what I was gonna do for them. And they left because it was a school night and the older folks got me around the table and said, what are you gonna do for our youth? And I think that sums up Bacon Hill Reformed Church is that caring nature for one another. None other has ever known. My name is Pandora Davis. I am um, a veterinarian and a wife and a mother and went to vet school 
and focused on food animal medicine. Um, and um, met my husband, um, who was a dairy farmer, who is a dairy farmer. And I now uh, live on the farm with him and my two children and work. I have my own private practice. My name is Jan King, and Pandora and I have two high school children, Nate and Hannah. And as parents, I don't think that we could be any more proud uh, for all the things that they do and the people that they're becoming. I think we would both say uh, that they, they both exhibit a great deal of responsibility uh, and, and the things that they, they do, um, they always seem to be very committed in, in the activities that they're part of. Uh, I believe in the future of agriculture. With a faith born, not of words, but of deeds. Achievements won by the present and past generations of agriculturalists and the promise of better days through better ways, even as the better things we now enjoy have come to us from the struggles of former years. Growing up on a farm, I see how much that agriculture impacts us and it is something that we could not live without. And I like how the creed really lays out for um, people what agriculture is doing and how much more than what they see or think about. I have a lot of friends that are agriculturally related and live on farms or have animals and that they live right here in Bacon Hill or just a little outside of it, um, but it's a close community. I started playing basketball about six or seven years ago with uh, five other people and my dad coaching. Um, a lot of the things that I started doing when I was young and still do now, it's with a lot of the same people and those people have become very close to me. Many of my close friends, you know, came from growing up around here, you know, a lot of cousins I would consider friends, you know, we share the same interests. Vincent and I, uh, we do drive down every day to school together, and I think we've become very close, and that's been really nice just to always have somebody to talk to. We are both in a Holstein club together called the Tri-County Holstein Club. I've traveled to earlier this year. We went to Indianapolis, Indiana, for the National FFA convention, and that was amazing. We took um, a three-day trip on a bus down there together and stopped in many states and went to horse farms and cattle stockyards and a cheese factory. So it's a really good experience at an FFA. We had uh, one of our homebred cows uh, was first place out there in reserve intermediate champion. And I think, you know, a big accomplishment for me, but really just the whole farm, everyone that's involved in what we do, really you know, it was a great achievement to go and compete at such a high level and do so well. Um, with also with lacrosse, I've traveled pretty far. Um, I'm working on trying to convince my parents to let me go down to Texas here in the next couple, coming weeks here and at the end of December for a tournament. Um, I've been to all across the Northeast. Um, I'll be going down to Maryland for some tournaments. So lacrosse has kind of brought me all across the country. I've started to look at colleges. I definitely would like to go play college lacrosse. Um, so there's that kind of you know limits where I want to go. But I really want to combine a school that has you know really high academics along with you know a really good lacrosse program. So uh, right now I'd say I'm really interested in business and kind of a finance economics side of you know industry. We have the King Brothers Dairy side uh, where we produce you know, our own uh, milk products. And I think there's lots of opportunities for marketing in there and some finance and how to run a business. For me, at the moment, I am still very undecided on what I want to do in the future. There's so many opportunities out there and so much that I've been interested in that I don't know exactly where to go. In the end, I really just want to stay kind of close to my family. I just love them so much and they've given me so much um, that I wouldn't want to leave them and go away.